Hello, and welcome to Aging Matters, a program featuring individuals who talk about aging-related issues of interest to older adults and their families. I'm Cheryl Beversdorf, your host. For the past several months, Aging Matters TV show has showcased stories of life, featuring guests who share the way their experiences have made a difference to them and to their community. Each program highlights memorable life moments of these individuals and provides insights about lessons they have learned. Today, my guest is Dr. Anne Marie Nelson, an anatomic and clinical pathologist with more than 35 years experience in global infectious disease pathology and HIV. Dr. Nelson will describe her work as a pioneer in description and diagnosis of HIV-related conditions and in global health pathology in the U.S. and Africa. She will also discuss her focus on capacity development in, in laboratory diagnosis and providing mentorship and expert advice to pathologists around the world. So welcome, Dr. Nelson, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Cheryl. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Dr. Nelson, let's start when you were young. Good, good way to begin a conversation. So where did you grow up and what career options did you believe you had as a young woman? Well, I was born in Montana. Um, we had a dairy farm, but when I was four, we moved to Southern California for my dad's employment regions. Um, so I grew up, I was one of four children. I have two older brothers and one younger brother. So I sort of was always a tomboy, hung out with the guys. Um, and I'm not, neither one of my parents, my mom was a normal school graduate. So she was a teacher, but she couldn't teach in California. And my father worked in the aerospace industry as a engineering technician, technologist. So they didn't have a college education and no one in my family was in medicine in any way. So that was never in my mind when I was growing up, but I was always curious. My brothers would shoot birds or shoot whatever with their BB guns and then I would dissect them. So <laughs> I guess I had a pathologist growing in me and didn't even realize it. Um, so I just, you know, went to school in Thousand Oaks, California is where I went to high school. And I really wasn't interested in science. I liked geography and history and thought I was gonna do something related to that. Um, and I assumed I was gonna to go to college because I didn't know what else I was gonna do. Um, but my senior year of high school, rather than taking physics or chemistry, I took anatomy and physiology because I thought, oh, well, that's something interesting that would be helpful for everyday life. So the teacher, um, Dr. Peterson, was a, an amazing teacher and I just got so excited. I learned all kinds of stuff. I'd go in after school and work with him in the labs and stuff. So that sort of was the beginning of my um, love of science and medicine. And then I went to college a couple of years at Valparaiso in Indiana. And then I was gonna do nursing but the nursing school hadn't started, so I had to take a year off, and then I ended up never going back. I started working in a hospital laboratory and eventually at a tuberculosis sanitarium where we were screening the Vietnamese refugees for TB. So I was doing skin tests and TB testing. Um, and the pathologist that I worked for, um, incurred, first I encouraged me to go to medical school, but in the 70s, going to medical school as a woman was hard. In California, one in 30-something people got into medical school, and because I worked to put myself through, I um, didn't have a 4.0 average I needed to get in. So I became a medical technologist, but the pathologist, Dr. Channing, that I worked for said, you need to go to medical school. I know people who are going to medical school in Guadalajara, so why don't you go down there? So he, his um, practice, there were three of them in the practice, um, 
loan me the money to go to medical school, basically um, no interest loans. So, and then when I came home from medical school on vacations, I used to work 60 to 80 hours a week, making enough money to live on when I went to school. So your career path, uh, you, it sounds like you, some of the interest you were showing already before you went to college. And, and let's back up a little bit. Where did you attend college? My first two years, I went to Valparaiso in Indiana. Okay. In college. And um, then I went out to work for a couple of years or for a year to wait to go to nursing school and then ended up working in a lab. And I worked at a tuberculosis hospital. And because it was downtown LA, I ended up transferring to USC and I graduated from University of Southern California. Just so we kind of get the, the chronology, so did you attend medical school then right away after college? After I graduated, I hadn't, didn't get in, so I started a medical technology training program Okay. with the same pra pathology practice that I worked in the labs at the TB hospital. And so that I graduated in 72 and I started medical school in 74. So you were in, and, and where did you go to medical school then? What was the... Autonomous place? University of Guadalajara in Mexico. Okay. And at the time, they were letting classes in like um, two classes a year, fall and spring semester classes. And there were probably about 200 to 250 Americans in each of those eight classes. So there were a lot of Americans. That was sort of the out of US option at the time. And because of the Vietnam War and other things, there, there, and less slots in medical schools at that time, a lot of people chose that option. What led you to pathology? Did you consider different specialty areas or was pathology the first thing on your mind? If you go to medical school out of the US, you have to do a year of clinical um, it's called a fifth pathway. So it gives you experience in clinical care in a U.S. teaching institution. So I applied for a fifth pathway and I was actually doing pediatrics um, and internal medicine. But because I'd worked in a pathology lab for a long time, um, I kept doing working extra time in, in the pathology department where I was. And I just decided I liked pathology a lot more than being up all night with sick babies. <laughs> uh, and it was intellectually interesting, but also during the time I was doing the fifth pathway, um, I went to a parasitology course that was given for a week at the, at, um, in the lab where I was working. And I'd ask them, where can I learn tropical medicine? They said, oh, UCLA has this course um, in tropical diseases. And it's free if you don't want credit for it. It's on Wednesday night. So I started going to that. And the invited lecturer for that year was a man named Dr. Daniel Connor. And Dr. Connor had worked in Uganda and he was head of infectious disease here in Washington at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And he gave such an inspiring lecture that after two hours, I said, I know what I wanna do. I wanna do infectious disease pathology and study with Dr. Connor. So four years later, when I finished my residency, I came to the AFIP as a volunteer for a few months and worked in his department. And then um, an opportunity came up to go work in a hospital in what was in Zaire, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So I went out there to spend a few months um, and met the local young doctor who just returned from doing his master's in public health at Tulane. And we hit it off. And also um, I got a, an invitation from Dr. Connor and they said they need a pathologist to work at Proje Sita, which means AIDS project in Kinshasa, which was the capital of Zaire. Go and visit them and see if maybe you can um, get a job there since 
you have you're looking for a job and you have um, you speak French. So I did and it worked out. So about six months later, I went back full time and that was in September of 1986. Now, so that Dr. Nelson was your first real uh, involvement with uh, HIV, your work in HIV, this International AIDS Project? When I was a resident in 1981 in California at the VA hospital in Los Angeles, they had some of the very first cases of the new disease. It was originally called BRIDS, gay-related immunodeficiency, and then became AIDS. Um, acquired immunodeficiency. So I was familiar with AIDS and had seen quite a few patients during my pathology training, but I was thinking, oh, I want to go do um, TB and malaria and tropical diseases. And little did I know four years later that AIDS would be one of the leading causes of death in Africa. So I sort of stepped into, um, stepped into it at the beginning. And was, was simultaneously, was there the epidemic going on in our country too, in the U.S.? Yeah, it was first described in the U.S. and some in Europe. And um, some a researcher, Dr. Peter Piot from Antwerp, had done a lot of work on the original Ebola outbreak in Zaire. So he had some friends who said, we have these weird thing going on in our ICUs, people with wasting, terribly ill, die right away. So they went down and started looking at it and they realized that there was a huge epidemic of HIV in Africa. It was first described in, in Zaire, now Democratic Republic of Congo, and in Uganda. How about in the U.S.? Were you collaborating with anybody in the U.S. or was your focus really primarily in Africa? When I first went to the AFIP before I was officially sent out to Zaire, um, they were getting cases at the AFIP. People didn't know, you know, what were the infections going on in these, what was killing the patients with HIV. And so we got a lot of autopsies um, from civilian and military hospitals and early biopsies of lymph nodes and capillary sarcoma. So we were getting a lot and they came to the infectious disease. So I was one of the people looking at um, the cases. And t tell us about what was your job? I mean, did you, were you at a hospital then? Did, you know, I would like to know a little bit more about your scope of work in connection with HIV. I went to Africa, they just needed somebody to look at what, what did people in Africa ha have that were dying of HIV or other things. So I, we did several big studies. I did autopsies, um, biopsies like lymph nodes, placenta pathology, pap smear screening. So looking at GI biopsies, um, whatever the clinical uh, service needed information on, I provided the pathology diagnosis. And at the same time was training um, the Zairean pathologists. Given the fact that this was a new disease, both in the United States and Africa, perhaps in other parts of the world, what was the biggest challenge for you as a pathologist, for your, your medical colleagues, uh, just in general? What, what were you dealing with? It was a new disease, so there was no references. A lot, when I went there, people were assuming that the diseases in Africa were the same as in the US. Pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, Mycobacterium avium, Capuchy sarcoma. But when I got there, we found out that more, probably a third to a quarter of people who died of HIV died of tuberculosis. And the other thing was I'm, my chief of my department in the US said, don't stop looking until you stop finding. So it was frequent people would have three, four, five or six infections. So you don't just say, oh, they have TB and stop. You have to look for everything that they had. So that was challenging. And then over the course of decades, every decade, it was a new challenge. First, it was there was no treatment and we were seeing end stage disease or early manifestations. 
And then the second decade, people started getting antiretroviral therapy. So then we looked at the pathology of antiretroviral therapy because the drugs are not benign and they're taking them for their whole lives. So there was a lot of conditions associated with that. And now into this decade, it's um, once your immune system comes back, you get all kinds of strange reactions, abnormal reactions. So it's sort of watching the evolution of the disease during treatment. And that's always been a challenge. And you're, there are only a few of us, a dozen pathologists who have done HIV pathology since the beginning, probably less than that. So we're sort of the references. Now there's a lot more people and it, within each subspecialty, there's a lot of expertise. So that's always been a challenge because it's an ever-changing condition. And I understand right now, Dr. Nelson, that there still is not a vaccine to prevent it. But just what is the status now? You, you have a no, treatment. There's not a vaccine. Um, but there's a lot of options. There's um, treatment, multi-drug treatment and watching viral loads and starting to treat people earlier in their infection rather than when they're really already with AIDS and far advanced. So you can blunt a lot of the um, destruction of the immune system by starting people and keeping people on therapy to keep the viral load down which lowers transmission as well as keeping the patient healthy. Um, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, so people who are in high risk um, categories, sex workers or drug, you know, they can take a medication on a regular basis to prevent getting the infection. And post-exposure for healthcare workers who might've been stuck with a needle or exposed to somebody. So there's several different ways. Um, with the COVID pandemic, it's become a problem that accessibility of antiretroviral drugs and diagnosis is become limited in some areas because of the crush on the healthcare system in developing countries. It sounds like there's still a long way to go. If everybody can get tested and treated, then it's a chronic disease, more like diabetes. We focused on HIV, and as I understand it now, you moved on to global health pathology, which is broader. It, tell us about that. We got evacuated out of Zaire in 1991 because the, the economy and the political situation was collapsing. So I came back to the US and by that time I had a three-year-old son. So mostly I worked in the US on age-related things, but I did a lot of organizing of conferences at annual meetings and in, on infectious disease. And some of those, most of them were national meetings, but some of them were international meetings. And so the contacts I made through my HIV work, um, I often, organize a seminar on global pathology, global infectious disease pathology at different meetings. Um, probably a dozen or so between 1996 and, and now. But um, so I knew a lot of the people in the infectious disease community. And then I started, at first I'd give lectures on HIV. And then once my son graduated from high school, I felt more at liberty to do international work on extended basis. So um, I did a lot of lecturing in general global infectious disease as well as HIV. And define global health pathology. You mentioned what, since your specialty is infectious disease, what were some of the diseases now that you were focusing on beyond HIV? Parasitic diseases, tuberculosis in general, what are diseases that are specific to different you know, like there's a different set of infectious diseases in India than there is in Brazil. Some are the same, but some of them are different. So you would invite, I, I always had a rule in my international conferences that I had to have at least one speaker from each continent so that we would get a good broad perspective. So, um, so that was 
so I developed a, a large network of other pathologists interested in infectious disease. Cancer and other chronic diseases are also um, emerging now as things that they're looking at in developing countries. But I didn't do so much actual subspecialty work in those in cancer or chronic diseases, but the capacity to diagnose, you have to have to say laboratory set up, you have to have the technicians who are able to prepare the slides for the pathologists to look at, good microscopes to read the slides. So with the um, American Society of Clinical Pathology and the U International Academy of Pathology among others, we have developed networks where people can get access to um, the equipment that they need, as well as training. Now, I understand that you had a Fulbright Fellowship that you were awarded. Was the focus of your work in that area the, also the infectious disease, or was that something special? The Fulbright, which I got in 2008, and I did it over 2008-9, I did six months, because that's what you can do as a federal employee without losing um, status, get employment, employment status. So um, it was developing the laboratory capacity to diagnose HIV-related infections, and also working with um, the low, I worked at McCary University in Uganda and Muambili University in Tanzania. And we did a lot of work in developing, did big autopsy studies. Uh, what is the cause of death in, in patients in Uganda and how has it changed over time? And so I did a lot of work with that and had other grants uh, from various places to work on things. I did some lab capacity building in Kenya as well. I'm curious, obviously you've traveled to many, many different countries. So you've established yourself medically and uh, as scientifically as well. Did you participate in cultural, social activities? What was your involvement? I think I've lectured in 22 or 23 countries. Um, because I spoke Spanish living in Guadalajara, I've been invited several times to Bolivia, Argentina, Colombia. And I don't go to meetings without doing travel, some traveling around. So I've been to the witch's market. I've been to, I think it's almost 15,000 feet in Lake Titicaca in Bolivia and went to the wine regions in um, in Argentina, and I've been to India a couple of times and Thailand. So I got to go visit Angkor Wat. We've talked about our mutual uh, visits to Angkor Wat. So I try to do a lot of um, international traveling, but each country also has special traditions that they have. In India, they have something called the lighting of the lamp of knowledge. So before you begin a conference, sort of the keynote speaker will go and light the lamp of knowledge with the, the conference organizer. So there's a lot of really interesting things and I've met many wonderful people that I'm friends with still. The other thing I was going to uh, just acknowledge is that you are an author and a lecturer and, and you've won awards or you received awards, not won, but so talk a little bit about what you've written about and then uh, the awards that you've received. I think probably the most I've written about, and I have um, a colleague in England who's the other person who's been doing AIDS pathology since 1981, Sebastian Lucas. And he and I have written a lot on chapters and articles on the evolving pathology of HIV. So I've done that and then specific conditions and often I'm a co-author, like a second, third author um, in other projects that I provided the pathology expertise. And then the other thing is doing this work with, um, you know, how do you fix pathology if you have no idea what pathology is in developing countries? So over a course of two years, I did a huge survey of all the countries in sub-Saharan Africa and how many pathologists they actually have and how many people are they training. So I've published quite a bit on, on uh, workforce 
and mentoring of young pathologists. And awards? Um, the International Academy of Pathology, for whom I've organized a lot of these conferences and um, given lectures, has been around since 1907, 1906. And in the 90s, they started giving a couple of awards every other year at the International Conference called the Gold Medal of Pathology. It's often given to people who were presidents of the organization or done things like that. And so in 2013, when I was told that I was getting the award, um, I said, well, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, you've mentored a lot of people. In fact, the African pathologists call me mama. So they said, you've nurtured pathology in ways that most of us can't do. So I said, I was the first person to get it for being nice. <laughs> well, we congratulate you. So one final question, Dr. Nelson, in, in what areas of pathology now are you, are you continuing to provide your, your consultation, your expertise, your knowledge? Um, well, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology closed when they closed the Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., and they formed something called the Joint Pathology Center. But what the Joint Pathology Center has is all the archives of cases going back to the Civil War but the infectious disease collection goes back mostly to World War I. So with one of my colleagues who's worked there for a long time, we've organized all those materials and I've created databases and we work on different things um, using those collections for teaching. We recently did a big study of measles cases going back to World War I and looking at the pathology of measles because people don't recognize it anymore because it hasn't been around, but it's coming back. And I'm starting to put together a collection of COVID cases that have come in. So mostly I'm doing organizing collections and supporting the work. And I still do lectures and um, write papers on HIV. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. You're Nelson. Welcome. And I want to acknowledge that Dr. Anne Marie Nelson, anatomic and clinical pathologist, thank you for joining me today. And I hope this Stories of Life episode has been enlightening and may inspire you to think in new ways about your own life experiences. This program is broadcast Sundays at 5.30 p.m. and Wednesdays at 6 p.m. on Comcast Channel 69 or Verizon Channel 38 in Arlington, Virginia or streaming live at those times on arlingtonmedia.org. And by the way, Aging Matters is also on the radio. It's broadcast every Tuesday at 2 p.m. on WERALP Arlington, 96.7 FM. And you can listen to all Aging Matters radio's programs by visiting mixcloud.com forward slash aging matters or tiny.cc forward slash aging matters archive. Finally, both radio and TV Aging Matters programs are posted on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Aging Matters WERA. Thank you for watching the program today. Please join me again for the next Aging Matters show. And until then, remember, age is just a number, not a label.